Hello, English 46A students. Okay, so <clears throat> um, I just um, videotaped a Mary Roth lecture. I'm now going to do a Dunn and Johnson or a Dunn and then later a Johnson. Um, I'll follow that up with um, Shakespeare and the sonnets and, uh, and then go back to some more Duchess Amalfi and then go to um, good old Paradise Lost. Not all in this one single tape, okay? Probably this will be a done tape, but first it's going to be an, an overview. And, um, and I mean an overview in a very particular, particular way. Okay, so in, in, a, in a survey course like this, obviously yeah, 800 years in 16 weeks, we lost some weeks. Um, it's a lot easier for me to carry, cover a lot more and be suggestive and get some energy going with in class. This remote teaching is, is not my first cup of tea. Um, but one of the things that, that surveys do is they attempt to, to put you in a position where you can have a sense of movement over time, periods that work, potentially evolution or progression. Those tend to be myths. There do tend to be changes. And in a given tradition, people, writers, tend to not want to simply repeat themselves. So that sometimes fidelity to a tradition or fidelity to the past is a strong value. Um, after Ben Johnson's death, there were, uh, or actually, uh, actually while he was still alive, there were a group of poets who called themselves the sons of Ben, as in the sons of Ben Johnson. They were not his biological children. They were his poetic children. And they felt that Ben Johnson had a clarity of style, which was quite a bit like the plain style um, that we looked at earlier in the Elizabethan miscellany but that also he could be flowery, ornate, musical, as he wanted to be, okay? That sort of thing. We still get schools of poetry like that. You might think of the 20th century and the beat poets, that sort of thing. Okay, so you get this, and you know, the Norton is really good about giving you all that information. This is my ninth edition, in the 10th edition, uh, whichever edition you have, um, all that material that can help you okay now today for a lot of what i'm going to be doing i'm going to be looking at using my my beautiful wonderful fourth edition <laughs> of the norton anthology okay it was only two volumes back then i mean i think the norton anthology if you went from medieval to 20th century i think it's six volumes now maybe five i don't teach those other classes right now so i haven't checked but anyway i'm going to be using my notes because you know what as an undergrad i wrote some good notes i had some good classes i wrote some good notes that should be encouraging to you you know it's not like oh you got to go further okay now something okay i also have some bad notes too by the way but we'll see how that goes all right let me emphasize a few things now one of the ways in which my professors, particularly, say, Professor Ray Oliver at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, would get me to focus on a period and not just have a bunch of generalizations floating through my head, you know, with these key words, all useful, frankly, all useful. Instead, okay, my cat's making trouble. Um, instead, he would, he would, we'd get that, or we'd be assigned it in the Norton, that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of my classes were on a need to know basis. Um, but one of the things that my professors would do is that they would say, Professor Oliver would put in front of me a poem by Wyatt, a sonnet by Shakespeare, and a poem by John Donne. And he would say, Let's look at how they are alike and let's look at how they are different okay now he would also he would want me to pay attention to uh, the presentation the performance of a character okay that speaker uh, and how how individualized that might be and what are the tricks what are the moves what's the craft 
by which that sense of an individual could be presented. Okay, we would also look at the form, the stanzas, the rhymes, the rhyme patterns, uh, the length of the line, uh, technical stuff I probably would have done in class a bit. I'm just not going to worry about how many feet. Is it a, uh, is it a trimeter? Is it a pentameter? You know, are there four beats? Are there five beats, etc. All this matters. Um, four beat lines get you quicker to the rhymes, so it's faster. Long lines, a five beat line, a six beat line, a seven beat line, it's much slower. Um, to get back to circle to a rhyme. And there's all sorts of tricks by which you can speed that up, etc. Um, I love talking about that stuff. And sometimes I teach a uh, uh, intro to poetry class um, because then I get to go all in on that sort of thing. All right. But here's the thing with a Wyatt, a Shakespeare, and the Dunn. All three poets are interested in sounding I would argue fresh, but fresh is hard for us to, to, to truly understand it unless we're reading everything. Um, but also alive. Okay. And there's the play of thought and is there the music, right? There's a certain sound of euphony. Now, euphony is the best music, I almost said noise, the best music for the purpose. Okay. So sometimes we want music. We want a very strong musical sense in a poem. Other times that music's going to get in the way of the thought. You know, if you if you think of, say, a nursery rhyme, Jack and Jill went up the hill to get a pail of water. If you use that kind of a style when you're trying to like pour your heart out that you're feeling despair, and I hope no one is, there's going to be a, a, you know, a strange juxtaposition of those two things. And you know, there are poets and singers and songwriters out there who can make it work, but most of us would want a more sober music to go with a sober thought. Okay. Um, all right. So Dunn, one of the things interesting about John Dunn, um, read about his biography. The man lived a wild life. Okay. And also... Well, I want to say something about, about his receptive. I've actually talked about Dunn, I believe, in, in... No, that was for the other class. All right. Um, okay. Reception history. So reception history is how someone is appreciated or not through time. I've talked about this a little bit with, um, with Surrey, the Earl of Surrey, and how for the longest time he was considered the premier poet of his day. And then later, he was eclipsed in the rankings, as it were, by the estimation of Wyatt. And I talked about how this was a little bit, um, Surrey was so mellifluous, so fluid, so regular in his music, that later that was considered a flaw. Okay, in his day and past, that was considered a great beauty. Um, but, you know, fashions change in how people see the past changes i mean for example one of the greatest american novels ever written is herman melville's moby dick 1850 1851 it was a bust in his own day um failed to sell um people liked his simpler uh, adventure tales instead of the sort of metaphysical things that happen in moby dick and by the way, Moby Dick is a great book. I teach it in 1B every so often. It is, uh, lots of it is hilarious. Lots of it is grand adventure. And uh, it's about work mostly, you know, uh, the whalers. And again, I used, I had a hard time teaching it uh, because of whaling. Uh, you know, I'm against whaling. But up until oil was being pumped out of the ground in Pennsylvania, at a certain point in around 1855-60 maybe, 1870 at the latest maybe, if you weren't burning wood or if you weren't burning a wax candle, you were using whale oil at, to light your house. You were using whale oil to lubricate the machinery in the factory, okay? And that's why people would sail around the world, okay? 
I went off on Moby Dick, partly to show reception history. That novel was a bust. Um, after Melville died in 1891, I believe, some people got sort of interested to look up his stuff, and there was a movement, and more and more people read it, until by the time you hit 1900, there are people saying, this is the greatest novel ever written. Reception history. Now, Dunn uh, was first seen as innovative, and when we, t when I, 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 you've probably, blah, blah, okay, you've probably noticed that, okay, that is, he, wow, he sounds different, um, okay, he was first seen as innovative in his own time, then he was seen as difficult and unmusical as time went by and people didn't want to read him. Um, then he was ignored, and then he was rediscovered and heroicized for gritty self-representation. I'm wondering if that's a quotation from somewhere, because I would say that, but it's such a specific phrase. Um, for example, by the time you get to the modernist poets in the late um, 19th, early 20th century, they loved John Donne. They felt he there was a voice, there was a, a, an individual in each poem that was so strong. And so therefore he, he ends up influencing later poets and they start imitating. I mean, this is one reason to read the past, whether or not, if, if you're like me, a reader, I mean, I write some poetry and I've certainly gotten my inspiration uh, in part by wanting to sort of uh, work some, some music, work some thoughts, work some numbers from the past. Okay. All right. So here's the thing about Dunn, and I'll, I'll give you examples shortly. Um, he can seem like this really fresh voice, but actually he's still doing everything that we've seen other poets do. He's apostrophizing. He's talking to death and addressing death and talking about what does death and life mean. He will personify. He will... Um, play with the tropes of we need a poem on mortality. We need a poem that calls into question what love is. Um, he usually, it's a highly um, dialectical. A leads to B leads to C, but not in the case of D. That sort of thing, actually. It's, it's again, there's this, this strong concentration of mental activity and um, uh, very logical. And again, I've said that about Wyatt and the Elizabethans, and I'm saying it about these Jacobean poets as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to point you at some first lines of Dunn's to help you see how this works. Okay. And in these three poems, you're going to see a speaker in a specific situation, audacity, boldness of thought and attitude, conversational rhymes, so that it doesn't feel like Mary had a little lamb whose fleece is white as snow. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, you'll see. Uh, and then the formal elements. Oh yeah. Um, so the conversational rhymes tends to mute the music without abandoning it. It's still musical. Um, and these poems are still about love and relationships. Okay. So let me see if I can do this really quickly. For example, um, let me find my notes. The Flea on page 923 in your Norton, the 10th. I'm skipping some notes. So the Flea, right? Look at the beginning. The Flea. Mark, but this, oh, and footnotes definitely useful with, with all these poets. So don't, don't miss them. Okay. The flea. Mark, but this flea and mark in this, how little that which thou denyest me is. Me it sucked first and now sucks thee. And in this flea are two bloods mingled be. Okay. We have a concrete situation in which we have a speaker talking to a, another person. In this case, male to female. Um generally considered and a flea there's a real flea and the flea bit him and then it bit the the other person in the room and his real point is going to be okay this is a sort of 
seduction poem, but it's crazy because imagine grabbing a flea and saying, look, you won't, you won't give me your virginity, but this flea's already got your blood. So it's, and, and, and it had my blood, our blood's been shared. So what's the big deal about, you know, body fluids? Okay. Seriously, that's what's happening in the poem. And so, you know, while he's doing this thing about, you know, and again, he's going to bring in religious metaphors about the mingling of blood and, you know, it's, it's a, it, as if it's marriage, this mingling of blood, this blood sacrifice, this blood ceremony. But by the third stanza, she kills the flea. And he's like, oh man, you've killed us. He doesn't mean it though. He's being clever for the sake of being cleverness. And you know, cleverness can sometimes work, uh, you know, uh, in romantic situations. I think that's what we're supposed to see here. And, and then he makes a joke because it's just, it's just a flea, right? But again, taking that idea, well, if blood, if the mingling of, bodily fluids matters we've just done that look at the fleet okay vivid innovative highly concrete situation but he doesn't write every poem like that but let me give you a couple more okay um in the sun rising the sun rising is 926 in the 10th edition So you're going to have a speaker who's going to basically be annoyed that the sun's come up because he wants night to go longer so that he and his beloved, his lover, can have more sex. Okay. So this is what I meant by it. it's a, it's a personification. He's talking directly to the sun. Busy old, f the sun rising. So it's morning, right? Time to go to work can't lay in bed busy old fool unruly son why dost thou thus through windows and through curtains call on us must thy motions lover seasons run saucy pedantic wretch go chide late schoolboys and sour apprentices go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride call country ants to harvest offices love all alike no season knows nor climb nor hours days months which are the rags of time. You know, love should not be on the clock. Love should not have to run with all these different uh, rags of time. Talk about connotation and the lowering of um, value. Um, you know what? You know whether it's hours, days, months. These are just the rags of time. Love shouldn't do that. Love should just run forever. Love should be in a different world. Um, I find this a lot of fun. Um, I like that idea of this concrete speaker who is going to rail at the sun because frankly, he wants to, he wants to spend more time um, with his lover. And then he'll take that and run with it um, as much as he can. But usually in this case, a stanza, it's a, it's a, it's the next developed thought. Okay. Still related. Or in, um, the canonization, which I believe is on the next page. Um, and again, read the footnotes for God's sake, hold thy tongue and let me love or chide my palsy or my gout, my five gray hairs or ruined fortune flout. With wealth, your state, your mind, with arts improve. Take you a course, get you a place. Observe his honor or his grace. Or the king's real or his stamped face. Contemplate what you will approve. So you will let me love. Like, get off my back and let me love. You know, go, you know, or, you know, you know, hold your tongue and let me love, you know, yeah, complain about something else. You know, tell me I'm too old. Tell me I'm too poor, whatever. Go get a job. Go, go, you know, focus on money. Go serve the king. Just do something other than bother me. I'm busy. Okay. 
because I am busy with things that are important. Okay, so again, one way to often with a done poem also, you get a clue right at the beginning of the stanza. For example, for God's sake, hold thy tongue and let me love. And then that's going to be developed. Stanza two. Alas, alas, who's injured by my love? You know, uh, when I sigh and cry, I don't drown merchant ships. You know, the economy of England is not going to be affected if I'm in love, right? Alas, alas, who's injured by my love? Call us what you will. We are made such by love. Call her one, me another fly. We're tappers too and at our own cost die. Okay, we're like these candles, tapers that burn down as we, we burn with love. You know, we, we are reduced until we're nothing. Oh, well, that's just how it is. You know, if you don't like it, go away. <laughs> you know, we can die by it, if not live by love. We'll build in sonnets pretty rooms as a well, as well a well-wrought urn becomes. The greatest ashes as half-acre tombs. And by these hymns all shall approve us canonized by love. Actually, you're denigrating me and my beloved, my lover, for being in love. But you know what? One, we don't hurt anybody. Two, we are going to like rise like phoenixes from the ashes. We are going to be canonized. We are the saints of love. That's how great our love is. And remember, part of the point of any love poem, not any, lots of love poems are about it's bad, you're horrible, whatever. But a lot of them are about, no, 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 this is special. Okay, this is a special thing. And I'm going to prove it because I'm going to write the poem. Shakespeare does this a lot. All right. And he even claims in that poem, like, later people are going to call us the saints of love. Okay, I'm paraphrasing into modern English in part to tease you to find what I'm saying in the poetry. Let me talk about a couple more right here. Okay. Um... I just love so much of Dunn's work. Um, and there is so much for you to look at. Um, so, like, a, one poem I would totally recommend. A Valediction Forbidding Morning. Okay. Um, you know, there's notes. This tone's about not feeling sad. Um... The second stanza. So let us melt and make no noise, nor no tear floods, nor sigh tempest move for profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. Let's be private. Let's not cry. because of, This is a poem about being parted. Okay. Um, tear floods, sigh tempest, that is so Anglo-Saxon. These are Kennys, right? Okay, but we're going to be private, that sort of thing. Um, but this one's got some wonderful... Two wonderful uh, images that I want to share with you. Again, this is a valediction, a farewell. That's what valediction means, words of farewell. Forbidding mourning. We're not going to make a show of being sad. One, he claims that our two souls, this is line 21, our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion like gold to airy thinness beat. Gold has the property that theoretically you could hammer it and thin it out if it was pure gold. Okay. And it would go forever if you just could do that. So to airy thinness. So I'm here. No, you're here. I'm going away. We're connected. That thin layer of gold, and notice the connotative power of gold, right? Rooted in a reality that pure gold can be thinned and it won't just break. Okay? That's one of the properties. So, again, I love symbols that are rooted in reality. Uh, they have more power. Um, so that's one. Then he goes on and compares them 
to a compass. And I don't mean a compass for finding where north is. I mean the other kind of compass. Oh, I meant to have one handy and I, I forgot. The kind of compass that you use to draw circles, right? I mean, in my school things, we had one had a point and then you had a circle and then you move it around, you put fix it. That is the beloved, the lover in this poem. And he goes further away, but he's still connected, right? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a V. And so even as they seem to go further, it's just that connection is stretching, but it's never broken, just like the gold. And just like the gold being beat to airy thinness, a compass for drawing those circles works like that. It's connected right? It's one piece. It's got two points and you can see the mark here and you can see that circle going around, but it's all connected. Okay. Bound together through love, he says. See, Dunn's fun, but he can be difficult. Remember I said reception, people start going, man, he's making us work too hard. Like, why would you, why would you talk about a circle device, a compass, if you want to talk about love, you should be talking about flowers and, you know, I don't know, savings. I don't know. Right. Wine and flowers. Okay. Done is innovative. Done is clever. Okay. Um, in the relic, which I don't remember if it's actually in our, our collection, probably is it's famous. Uh, he turns himself into Christ and the lover into Mary Magdalene, if you read this poem. Now, for some people, that's blasphemous. Highly, highly blasphemous. Um, Dunn's a Protestant, not a Catholic, so he can do this a little bit. But he also means it a, he's a man of the church at this point, by the way. But there's this, it opens. When my grave is broke up again, some second guest to entertain... For graves have learned that woman had to be to more than one a bed. And he that digs it spies a bracelet of bright hair about the bone. Will he not let us alone and think that there a loving couple lies who thought that this device might be some way to make their souls at the last busy day meet at this grave and make a little stay? Okay, this is a dramatic situation in which, and this is true, Graves in this period were not expected to only hold one person. Um, you dig them up after a certain amount of time. You reuse the grave, the body that's in there, whether it's in a coffin. If enough time has gone by, the coffin has rotted, the, the flesh is gone, the bones just, just, you know, are what's left. And in this case, he imagines that when it's disturbed, they're going to see our two, you know, the two bodies there, um, that hair, the brightness around the bone. Because, you know, hair will be left too, potentially, on that scalp. And maybe they'll muse and think, wow, they probably were in love. Their bodies are entwined. Maybe they did that. They want to be buried together so that at the second coming, again, it's a Christian universe in this in this in this period. Um, at the second coming, when bodies rise up and and are either sent to heaven or hell, that they would be together. That would be the point of being buried near each other. Okay, but there's a lot going on here. Okay, there's one more poem I'm going to point to, which is on your page. 962 and it's called death be not proud it's a famous sonnet it's a holy sonnet as it was called at the time and it's a famous sonnet that um in which basically he's going to take down death he's gonna, talking to death and saying you know you shouldn't be proud you're not that big a deal you're gonna die we don't die you die now I am going to attach another video for that because I've already made a video for my 1B class in which I talk about that Renaissance poem and um, I believe two more modern poems, which I'm not worried about, but it'll be faster if I just attach that, that video lecture too. I hope you're doing well. That's John Dunn, lecture from Matt Duckworth. <laughs>